What is the purpose of philosophy? To bring peace to that metaphysical, maybe existential worry. So, in a way, true philosophy cures oneself of philosophy and making every philosophical problem completely and definitively disappear. This is one reason that Wittgenstein is very interesting to me. And somebody that I'm going to spend a lot more time with. Um, basically, going from his Tractatus to Philosophical Investigations, Pierre Hadot gives a really good guideline in understanding ancient philosophy or modern reading of such, and that is... Um, Hadot's insistence on not separating conceptual structure from literary structure also played a significant role in his interpretation of philosophy. So, in a real sense, as I was thinking about this, or not thinking about this, all of a sudden I was thinking about Genesis and let there be light. And... I really thought to myself, Genesis, if you, look, if you consider the context of the book, the Bible as a book of literature, it's mostly me it is mostly metaphorical. And even the people that know it best, the Jewish and maybe the Kabbalists um, and Jewish, Jewish mystics, uh, you know, speak of the Bible as a metaphorical piece of literature or collection of writings of their people. And really what we're seeing and, and, and what we're reading is a evolution is the evolution of their consciousness as a people, I think. And when you when you read Genesis and let there be light, what does that really mean? I think let there be light is really referring not to the creation of a world, but to the dawning of our awareness within the world. that's one reading possible I guess reading of it and that's what resonates for me makes me think of William Blake and so much of his writing a lot of philosophical writing sometimes from history especially ancient history doesn't really have a systematic structure that we recognize from our time. And so that takes a real effort or maybe a relaxing of our beliefs and our own prejudices to be able to put ourselves in the context of, the, of what was written. So much of philosophy for so long in ancient philosophy was verbal and oral and not often written down. And uh, what we have are, generally are these unsystematic collections of aphorisms. But uh, Hado speaks about Marcus Aurelius, and I think it's very insightful what he realized about it, that it was a collection of notes that he'd been taken, but there was also uh, an underlying philosophy that undergird his notes. They were actually spiritual practices or practical practices. Um which are kind of the foundation, three foundations of Stoic philosophy, which I won't really go into right now, um, but another time. Um, but that when you see Marcus Aurelius's meditations in context, they're just not note. They're just, they simply they aren't simply notes, autobiographical notes. I mean, they're really reflecting his personal practice, so to speak which is uh, very illuminating and enlightening if you read meditations from that perspective. Um, they are not as disjointed, his notes are not as disjointed as, as they would seem without that awareness, possibly. But uh, this is this is Hado's opinion, and I, I think there's a lot of wisdom. Generally, Hado is you know, right on as far as my experience. Um, he brings a... A mystical element to his reading of ancient philosophy that is, it, you know, really it's a curative working on us and the practicing of it 
is really bringing about a healing in us and our minds. And uh, hmm. so in that way, philosophy really is more of a medicine than anything, a corrective um, to our errant thinking and feeling. And it seems to me when we do that thinking and feeling out of context is when we get into the most trouble. That's the same for writing, I think, and working and our work we do. Um, our lives are not just these individual frames, but they're connected in a way, and they're connected to humanity. And in that sense, perhaps our lives could be thought of as symbols of human consciousness, that each of us is a representation or collection of symbols. And it's in the different, it's, you go into deep differentiation and then come out of differentiation and you kind of dive into the water and you come back up out of the water or you fly into the sky and you come back to the ground and the ground is the context. What is the context of our awareness? I mean, is it not being? And this is a lot of what I, I, Pierre Hadot, um, a philosophical historian that I've been studying, um, speaks a lot about. And it's resonating quite a bit with me. So uh, let me read a little bit from uh, Philosophy as a Way of Life. Um, again, th th uh, this is... <laughs> there's so much meat just in the introduction. Um, and I've been reading all around. But uh, at the time Hado was writing about Wittgenstein... Wittgenstein, even today, so many philosophers ignored the way philosophical invest investigations is written that it is astonishing. I think at this point it's also good to mention the, the divide um, between the continental and analytic philosophers over the last hundred years um, in, in, in modern philosophical uh, work. Um, Hado, Whit, uh, Wittgenstein, and, and Bertrand Russell, they were analytic philosophers who, um, you know, who basically used logic um, to understand language. So they applied a systematic and almost mathematical um, uh, type of process. Um, and... Uh, that's very different from Heidegger, as an example. Um, ask different questions than analytic philosophers. Uh, I'll, I'll post a link to analytic versus continental philosophy uh, in the description. Uh, I won't go into it. Uh, I'm certainly not an expert on it. And uh, I'll leave it to the experts to give a better description of it. But I think it's important, though, to keep, as, as we're trying to read... As I'm reading uh, modern and ancient philosophy, I want to be cognizant of the context and also the, method, the methods used um, to present the ideas. Uh, Hado has, has an interesting point. Um, Hado claims that it is probably a mistake about the nature of ancient philosophy to consider abstraction made possible by writing its most important characteristic. For ancient philosophy, he says, at least beginning from the sophists and Socrates, intended, in the first instance, to form people and to transform souls. That is why, in antiquity, philosophical teaching is given above all in oral form, because only the living word, in dialogues, in conversation, pursued for a long time, can accomplish such an action. The written work, considerable as it is, is therefore most of the time only an echo or a complement of this oral teaching. So this is one reason why, for Hado, to philosophize is to learn how to dialogue, how to speak. A Socratic dialogue is a spiritual exercise practiced in common, and it incites one to give attention to oneself, to take care of oneself, to know oneself. The Socratic maxim, know thyself, requires a relation of the self to itself that constitutes the basis of all spiritual exercises. Every spiritual exercise is dialogical insofar as it is an exercise of authentic presence of the self to itself and of the self to others. The Socratic and Platonic dialogues exhibit this authentic presence in the way that they show that what is most important is not the solution to a particular problem, 
but the path traversed together in arriving at the solution. Hence, we can understand the critical significance of the dimension of the interlocutor with all of its starts and stops, hesitations, detours, and digressions. This essential dimension prevents the dialogue from being a theoretical and dogmatic account and forces it to be a concrete and practical exercise because, to be precise, it is not concerned with the exposition of a doctrine, but with guiding an interlocutor into certain s settled mental attitude. It is a combat, amicable but real. Kind of like chess, uh, I'll add. We should not... We should note that this is what takes place in every spiritual exercise. It is necessary to make oneself change points of view, attitude, sets of conviction, set of convictions, therefore to dialogue with oneself, therefore to struggle with oneself. Um, that's, a, that's a really uh, profound point there, I think, that I'll, I want to talk about a little bit. Um, we are arguing with what with ourselves, and I realized myself that uh, my my beliefs and my position had become very fluid in my life after I had kind of progressed through what I thought was really my own intense personal experiences. But really, I come to find out they kind of my experiences were following some kind of template almost. Um, that others had gone through and experienced. And I found a lot of relations between the way that my life was going and the questions I was asking and the things that were happening and what I read recently in modern and modernity and also in ancient, um, in ancient works, what life was like and what they struggled with and what they thought and felt. And that's, a, that's definitely um, I, the progression of wrestling, uh, the, the journey of wrestling with, with, through these things and, and basically realizing it's best to maybe not take any fixed position and not be a total relative, not to be a total relativist or, or, uh, or, uh, or a jellyfish. Um, but, you know, in learning to, in learning what your will is and learning the limits of it and the lack of limits of it and the effects of what you do and what others do and, the effects in the world and how that affects you. To make a fire, they pour split logs on the floor of the fireplace, cover them with kindling, add rolled newspaper, and light the paper on fire. This 20 minute process requires a fireplace, split logs. Alexa, stop. <laughs> Something I was saying triggered Alexa to tell me how to build a fire. I think that is very funny considering my post today is about let there be light. <laughs> um, maybe there are a lot of analogs on how to make a fire and, and, and what I was exactly just saying. You basically, you look for kindling, you look for small burnable, small burnable sources of fuel and you put those together and you spread those out and you kind of build an intensity when you're building a fire and that's the key to making a good fire is you start small and then you kind of let the fire take hold of and the fuel does what it does and and it kind of takes care of itself you're just kind of tending the fire you're not you don't own the fire you might you're bounding the fire you're not you're not creating or creating or uh, creating it per se mm. i mean i think in a lot of ways that, that yeah that's very uh, analogous to to this little to this little inner dialogue that I'm having with myself the the other reason that I like write I like writing myself and I also like reading and so I kind of thought reading writing would be a fun exercise and just a good experience for myself just to hear the words and to hear myself and to feel the words too and then to kind of talk about what do I feel about those and what's the con provide a little more context to the reading and um in that way an audiobook is an audiobook right but this is more something this is different 
This is more, these are kind of more, uh, I guess, guided readings. Um, but I, but really what I'm doing is I'm having a dialogue with myself. I mean, I'm, I, I want to say I don't necessarily adopt all these views or say that these, these views I, I, I'm kind of reviewing in these different, uh, in this series is, are necessarily what I believe or know to be true. I mean, these are kind of like just things that kind of came up along the way and things I've wrestled with. And uh, I guess I'm always going to wrestle with in, in some way. Um, I've decided I can't really take a fixed position or a final position on anything. Um, I have to use the best I have at the time to make the best decision and then hopefully have some time in there to be able to retrospect or introspect and, and, and look at what happened and, and see what went, what went well, what could go better, and then kind of see what, what my part in that is. And there's a part in the world, there's a way of seeing the world where you don't control a lot of the world. There are certain things within your control and much that is not. And a lot of the art or skill of life is learning to apply just the right amount of energy at the right point. Tip for maximum gain. And I mean, isn't that Occam's razor? I mean, energy is looking, is following the path of least resistance. I mean, and so things do simplify. Things do cancel out. Terms do cancel. And you can systematically look at th thoughts and ideas and logically analyze them and, and kind of decompose language and words and look into the meaning of, and the structure. The structure itself is part of the meaning. The context that it appears in is part of the meaning. The world at the time is part of the meaning. The feeling of the subject is part of the meaning. The feeling of the no subject is part of the meaning. I mean, like, these are, and, and written, written and spoken word, I mean, they are all after afterthoughts of the event. Abstracting about something that occurred or occurs, you're never going to be able to get the true sense of what I mean. You're going to hear your version of it and, and in that way, wrestle with it on your own and then come to your own meaning in the, in the, through the wrestling of it. Mm.